Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Before getting into the business of the day, let's go through some of the housekeeping items. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we are recording the session. Um, you will be muted on entry into the Zoom call. And if you have any questions, comments, feedback, submit them in the, in the chat section at the bottom of your screen. And we will address all the questions um, at the end. After all the presentations, then we will take questions. We will try our best to answer all the questions. However, if there's too many questions, we will um, make sure that we follow up via email or even contact you bilateral. Next slide, Holly. So most of you already know us, but for those of you who don't, we are a nonprofit climate science and policy institute based in Berlin, Germany. We also have offices in New York, Perth, and Lomé in Togo. Um, my name is Deborah Ramalope. I'm the team leader for climate policy analysis at Climate Analytics. I'm one of the core leads for this project um, that we will be talking about today, the 1.5 Pathways Project. I also have the pleasure to be joined today uh, by Salim Fakir. Um, he's the executive director of the African Climate Foundation. Thank you, Salim, for being here. Uh, Salim is our keynote speaker and I think very well qualified to give us a perspective on the African transition to low carbon development. Then he will be followed up by our policy analysts, starting with Kim presenting South Africa, Winnie Kayamba will be presenting Kenya and Nigeria, and Mark Kamel will be presenting Senegal and Egypt. Um, so those are the five countries that we will be sharing with you today, noting that we had other analysts working on the project, specifically Kali and Sarah, who also worked on Nigeria and Senegal. Also in the team, we are joined by our lead modelers on the project, Jonas Hosch and Lara Velda, who will be able to answer any of your questions. So feel free if you have any modeling related type of questions, um, um, please put them on the chat channel and they will be able to respond to your questions. Next slide, Holly. Let's quickly go through the agenda. I will start by introducing the project briefly. Then we will have Salim uh, with his keynote uh, speech and then straight into the five countries. Then at the end of the presentations, we will open up um, to get your questions, inputs, feedback. And as I said earlier, that we will try our best to respond to most of the questions here. However, if we run out of time, uh, we will follow up via email. Um, but we are also open. If you feel that you want to have further discussions with us on the project for a specific country, please feel free to contact, to contact us. Next slide, Holly. So a little bit about the project. Um, with the more interesting bits, I think uh, will be coming in the, in the countries that will be presented um, later on. The main objective of the project is, is to provide 1.5 pathways. We're doing this for 68 countries. And if you look at the map, um, all the blue colored areas, it's countries that are included in the, in the project. So it covers the, the whole, all regions basically. And we are very thankful to the IKEA Foundation for supporting this work. So why did we go for this project? Uh, it's mainly because we've identified the gaps at mainly at national level. As most of you would know, there are global and regional 1.5 pathways. And although this is an important and I think critical step, um, analytical piece that could be useful in informing national planning processes, many countries do not have 1.5 um, pathways at, at, the national, at the national level. We also know that current NDCs are not sufficient to reach 1.5, uh, with current estimates showing something around uh, 2.4 temperature increases by end of the century. So we're still a bit far from reaching 1.5. Um, and I think with more analytical work, basically to empower countries as they update their NDCs and come up with their long-term strategies. Um, and the timing wouldn't have been perfect, uh, given that countries are basically now, um, since last year, updating their NDCs and coming up with their, with their long-term strategies. Um, this would also be useful in providing national benchmarks uh, for national planning processes for development of sectoral policies. For now, we will only be presenting economy-wide pathways and power sector pathways. However, the, projects, the project includes all other sectors and those will be following um, in the next few months. Next slide, Holly. So the pathways we have considered in our analysis are from 
IPCC's special report on 1.5, which limit warming to 1.5 with no or limited overshoot. And we also used other lines of evidence, such as the 100% renewable pathway from the Energy Watch Group and Lutz University. If you want details on the methodology, we have details, uh, detailed the methodology that uh, we used in the modeling process. Um, it's available online. And as we downscale uh, to national level, pathways may take different approaches to stay within um, different, to, to remain within a 1.5 temperature limit. So as you downscale, then it, different countries take different approaches to remain within the 1.5. So we, we provide emission re reduction ranges instead of just one number. Um, and the details are provided in the, in the country profiles and can be found on the online web tool. So if you go onto the web tool that is um, live as we speak right now, you can basically click into a country and go into the details of, of that particular country to look at, for instance, the scenarios that, um, that we have um, explored, et cetera. Next slide. So what do we look at in this project? So the models used in this analysis basically evaluate technological and economic feasibility to come up with the domestic emissions pathways that we will be presenting here. Um, the, the results present economy-wide pathways for total greenhouse gases and CO2 emissions. This is, however, at the moment, excluding LULUCF, land use, and land, use, land use change and forestry are excluded at the moment, but we will be later presenting LULUCF pathways. Later in the year, uh, early next year, our pathways will include uh, land use as well. And for the power sector, we provide information that could be useful in policy development and national planning processes, such as fuel shares and fossil fuel uh, phase out dates for individual countries. We have all those for, for each one of the countries that we will be presenting. Uh, and you will see later on as we present the five countries, um, when are they a phase out, for instance, uh, you will be able to see the coal phase out date for South Africa as an example. And when can they reach their highest levels of renewables uh, as another example, that information is provided in the, in the country profiles. Lastly, one point to note before I hand over to Salim, this work does not look at fair share or equity principles. So the pathways we are presenting are more aligned to the notion of highest possible ambition, basically what levels of mitigation can a country reach um, by evaluating technical and economic feasibility without assessing who pays. So the who pays aspect is not included in our assessment, but we do acknowledge that the majority of developing countries, uh, particularly African countries will require support to close the gap between the fair share and the domestic emissions uh, pathway. I'm going to pause here and hand over to Salim. Salim, over to you. <clears throat> Deborah, thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be invited to this launch of your five um, uh, studies that you, you just mentioned. Um, I, I'm not a technical expert, but I wanted to sort of uh, cover what I think is uh, an important topic uh, given the historical juncture we are in, in relationship to a global push for, for net zero, uh, the need for decline in, in fossil fuels, and what that debate looks like uh, on the African continent. So I hope to share some, some insights on that. Um, so I, I found the profiles very useful. They tell an in interesting story, and the story is really about the gap between pledges and ambition. And uh, I think in the, the question of the gap, uh, that's really where the challenge lays and how to uh, bridge uh, the gap is, is crucial. And uh, as you will see in the South African example, we are in the throes of actually uh, discussing that. Um, so in the, in the five synopsis I've received, the scale of what countries need to do raises fundamental issues, not only of Paris compliance uh, in terms of the 1.5 degree pathways you've mentioned, but does, how does one reform the politics of climate and with that the economic reforms that are necessary uh, to get from point A to B, which is I think uh, really the, the most important point uh, that we have to grapple with. Uh, if we don't address the, the politics of climate and economic reform, indices become irrelevant pieces of paper if they are not linked to a broader economic transformation agenda. Uh, this is not something that can be done 
at the UNFCCC uh, uh, alone, uh, although that is a forum for advising and for cajoling and nudging countries in the right direction, but it has to be done internally by the politics of key stakeholders getting together within a given country and being able to reach a consensus that this challenge has to be met and to be able to link their domestic uh, uh, climate agenda with uh, an international goal. Uh, so the domestic processes of reform and investments uh, in new infrastructure are critical uh, to be able to reach that ambition. Uh, I think this is going to be the real nux, uh, crux of uh, uh, what we need to do. I would say that uh, in the recent uh, establishment of the Presidential uh, uh, Climate Commission, there is some light uh, at the end of the tunnel. I wouldn't say we're there yet. And the PCC, uh, just to, for the audience who don't know about the Presidential Commission, which was set up by President Ramaphosa and uh, uh, came into effect uh, early this year, originated out of a climate uh, decision, not, not out of a climate decision, but a job summit that was held by President Ramaphosa, I think towards the end of 2018 uh, or so. And his specific focus was to look at long-term uh, low emissions trajectory for so South Africa and decarbonization of uh, South Africa's electricity sector and other sectors. Uh, and he took a whole economic point of view and effectively, at least uh, as far as economic theory goes, asked the fundamental question, if we were to decarbonize, will this lead to full employment compared to a fossil-based uh, economy? And I think that's really the question that the PCC has to address. The PCC has just uh, completed uh, uh, a round of discussions around uh, uh, South Africa's uh, NDC, which, we, which the government released uh, for comment and the uh, NDC, uh, sorry, the PCC convened a whole lot of stakeholders together to discuss it. And I think you will hear some good news today when uh, the NDC report is handed to the president uh, today. So the PCC is a multi-stakeholder process, uh, given the nature of South Africa's uh, social economic issues and the make makeup of constituencies. It's made up of government, labor, business, climate activists, and so on. Uh, the PCC's role is advisory, but I can assure you that uh, in, the, in the way it, uh, it operates with cons uh, in its consultation process that, and its extensive participation by key ministers, that it is becoming a very influential uh, agency that is uh, uh, autonomous but statutory uh, to help to shape uh, South Africa beyond just a, a low emissions trajectory, but hopefully to set in stone uh, a net zero target and uh, with the lens of a just transition. Now, why is the South African uh, experience important? It's an important development in that it enables a breadth of different technical work from climate to economic transformation issues to come together in an attempt to address, uh, to draw a seamless relationship between uh, emissions, economic transformation, and the just transition. I think this is really the message in terms of Africa, that we have to get these three things right. Uh, emissions uh, profiles of the uh, in future, uh, the economic transformation agenda, and this question of just transition, given uh, the imbalance uh, in, uh, in uh, socioeconomic circumstances in many of the countries that you've uh, just put a profile in. Uh, so these types of processes have to be replicated elsewhere in the continent if we are to turn a piece of compliance paper into an economic transformation tool. Uh, this will not happen on its own without institutional mechanisms that uh, allow for societies, diverse groups and societies, and the most important players to deliberate, understand the headwinds that are coming, particularly on, for oil and gas countries on the continent, and agree on a way forward to adapt to, these, to those headwinds. NDCs also have to be framed within the macroeconomic profile of a country in order to understand economic and fiscal resilience that is needed uh, to shift uh, to new infrastructure, technology, and patterns of supply and demand that, are diff uh, that allow different sectors to be healthy, competitive, and new sources of investment and productivity. Uh, with this proviso that they, these economic reforms uh, that try to build around a new climate agenda are also inclusive and just economies. So for example, how feasible it is for Nigeria to shift from oil and gas, which is one of your studies, 
uh, uh, in order to lower its dependency on oil and gas to full electrifications without oil and gas. In any case, Nigeria has a challenge given its population size and a very small generation capacity. Of, uh, and this full electrification is not just a story of, of a shift of, uh, from away from fossil fuels to renewables, but also a long-term journey and shift from a oil dependent uh, uh, oil and gas dependent economy to a more diversified economic base. If people uh, examine the macroeconomic profile of Nigeria, you will see that it's highly reliant on exports of oil and gas. It has a, a very narrow, a very low diversified economic base, and uh, it's most of its government budget is uh, reliant on oil, oil and gas. So in order to unplug it from oil and gas, the alternatives and the solutions that, that need to be provided have to substitute in material ways uh, the Nigerian economy in order to meet, meet uh, not only its alignment to climate goals, but also uh, its other economic interests. So I want to leave you just in closing with four thoughts uh, as you grapple with Paris uh, and the 1.5 degree pathway and how we get there. Here are my four take homes for, for the audience. Uh, NDC profiles are useful, but insufficient as tools of change. A lot more has to be done. I've suggested that also uh, you look at institutional mechanisms that uh, can allow for consensus to be re reached around economic transformation. But very importantly, and I would encourage climate an analytics to look at uh, the macroeconomic profiles of these countries and how they, the NDC targets and ambitions uh, and the change that is needed can be facilitated by a macroeconomic analysis. NDCs have to be complemented with other processes and tools. Uh, and I would say that these are deeply political processes, uh, but yet South Africa has just succeeded to get key parties on board to shape potentially an agreement to a net zero target and how to get there. NDCs and 1.5 uh, degree pathways will confront vested interests. We should not underestimate this. Path dependency problems, especially in oil, gas, and coal countries uh, are one of those vested interests. They are like an enclave, a, a cartel of, of groups of interest that is very hard often to dislodge. So you need to convert an NDC goal into an economic transformation agenda. That cannot be done just by uh, pleading and, and uh, making moral uh, uh, arguments uh, in front of a, a very vested political elite. You have to mobilize a whole of society behind this. And this needs to speak to new investment opportunities in a decarbonized economy that can realize that economic theoretical milestone of uh, full employment. We also need to shift the de debate from a narrow climate finance agenda to a wider debate about reforms of the global finance architecture for both public and private finance. Decarbonization should be incentivized and countries will also start looking at domestic fiscal policy and incentives to encourage right investments because climate finance is too narrow uh, currently as it is framed in the Paris uh, Agreement of the 100 billion and so on uh, to solve the major global transition needs across the world and to do them, by the way, with a just transition lens. So finally, no transition on the African continent towards net zero is going to be easy and, uh, and so a different logic and narrative and case has to be made that is not just about future emissions trajectory, but also what economic change means. And in most cases, as this has to address the vested interests of elites. And in countries like South Africa, social partners like labor, civil society, et cetera, uh, citizens have to be brought on board. So I would leave you with those uh, few thoughts, uh, uh, Deborah, and thank you for, for the invitation to, to speak uh, at this event. Thank you so much, Salim. Um, definitely it's food for thought. Um, um, I see we are receiving a few questions already in the chat channel, um, so keep them coming. Um, we will address all your questions at the end. If you have any questions for Salim as well, please put them in the chat channel. And next speaker now, it's Kim, who will be presenting South Africa. Thanks, Deborah, and thanks, Salim. Uh, and so I thought we'd, well, we'd start with the, uh, our case studies with our biggest uh, emitter and at the furthest most point of the continent, South Africa. So um, South Africa has an abundance of natural resources, one of which is coal. 
uh, that it both exports and uses to generate electricity. And this has led to a really carbon intensive economy that is almost, not quite, but almost double the G20 average in terms of carbon intensivity and is also uh, you know, going the, the decarbonizing way slower than the G20 average. So those are the, some, some numbers for you. Um, and you can see from the tool on the right that 90% of our electricity well, in 2017 at least was, was generated from coal. And these are some of the, the pictures you can see on the, on the tool. And this is even though renewables have been cheaper than new renewables have been cheaper than new coal from as early as 2016, um, which provides a bit of a context for what South Africa is doing now. And on, that's on our next slide. Um, and so you can see from, from this uh, depiction, which is also on the tool that South Africa's current NDC is quite a broad range, um, ranging from 15% above 2020 levels all the way down to 24% below uh, 2010 levels, and that's uh, the target by 2030. And as Lee mentioned, the NDC update is ongoing. And uh, at this point, the suggestions for the updated NDC are to narrow that range quite considerably, but not to move the, the lower end of the range. So uh, the current or the current updated draft, <laughs> sorry, too many words, uh, there is for below 17 um, and up to below 24%. Um, down from 2010 levels of emissions, and this would be by 2030. And our current policy projections, which have been provided by um, Climate Analytics, other project, the Climate Action Tractor, points out that uh, based on this new, well, based on this updated draft NDC, the, the current policy projections are you know, within that band, which, while promising, is still producing a rather large gap in terms of ambition. Um, and that is because the, the 1.5 compatible pathway um, analysis suggests that South Africa should reduce emissions to 39% below 2010 levels, which is 15% short of the most ambitious end of the draft NDC range. And this is partly because of our uh, South Africa's continued coal dependency, which is outlined quite strongly in the IRP 2019. And naturally, uh, the continued coal dependency is incompatible with achieving a 1.5 pathway. And so um, if we could have a quick look at the next slide, Having outlined this, you can see that the, in South Africa, the, the, one of the, the most crucial sectors to transform is the, the power sector uh, because of our reliance on coal. And um, what we should do instead is uh, tap into our huge and cost-effective potential for renewables. So one of the, uh, as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, there are some um, phase out projections and in order to be 1.5 compatible, it would need to, coal would need to be phased out by the early 2030s with a simultaneous increase in the renewable energy share in the power mix by uh, 2030, so slightly earlier than the coal phase out. And uh, so far, it appears that CCS or uh, carbon capture storage and utilization, as it's called in South Africa, is not an option. There are geographical, geological cost constraints and very few so far identified developmental benefits to employing that. And all of that means that what we really need is a very clear pro-decarbonization policy, 
which provides signals to the economy, to investors, that uh, change is happening, but this seems rather unlikely in the current context. And furthermore, not a, I think Salim made it quite clear in the South African context, at least, that decarbonization is not just for climate change, but offers a wealth of developmental uh, benefits as well. Um, if we have stranded fossil fuel assets, it means that we lose jobs and job creation in South Africa is one of the foremost priorities. And once you lose jobs, obviously it has a knock on effect on communities, um, particularly poor communities, who are also often the most affected by um, the pollution in the, in the area. Um, so decarbonization helps us to avoid health system burden, uh, because particularly in, in poor areas like Pumalanga and Limpopo, where some of the concentrated coal industries are at the moment. So new green industries offer opportunities for job creation as well, and hopefully also cheaper electricity, so which could lead to universal access which in turn has its own developmental benefits in terms of like allowing children to read with electric lights instead of paraffin or candles and, you know, hopefully do better in schools and amongst a whole range of others. That's just one. And, and lastly, but very importantly, I think for a developing country is the opportunity that dark decarbonization offers to forge its own path and not be constrained in the future by what coal importing countries might want. So to be able to set out its own independent path and follow that. So that's South Africa. And now we'll take a whistle stop non-carbon intensive flight up to North Africa and I'll hand over to Marie Camille. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, so Egypt's national emissions are mostly dominated by the energy sector, um, uh, accounting for more than sixty more than sixty percent of the greenhouse gas of the total country of the total greenhouse gas emissions of the country, with the first uh, contributing subsector being electricity, uh, with around twenty four percent of it. So Egypt is the fifth oil producing country in Africa and the highest consumer in oil and gas of the continent. So logically, its power mix and prim primary energy are highly dominated by fossil fuels which is what you see uh, on the slide on the bottom right, with roughly 80% of the power mix uh, based on natural gas, which account for roughly uh, more than half of, uh, a bit more than half of primary energy, the rest being uh, oil. So during the years 2011 to 2014, uh, the country experienced severe power, power cuts, which were mostly due, although there were available capacities back then, um, there were several power cuts due to the slowdown of fossil fuel productions following the recession. Um, since then, the country uh, worked uh, in increasing its capacities and now is experiencing a surplus in its available capacity. So to give an order of magnitude, now the country has around 59 gigawatts of available capacity and a demand of roughly 30 gigawatts, so half of the available capacity. Um, so naturally, the country, Egypt, is thinking to export um, its power, uh, which is, however, those, unavailable, those available capacities are mostly based on natural gas. And as uh, mentioned, Salim, the, 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 world, the rest of the world is starting to engage on decarbonization pathways. Um, so they, that brings some uncertainties in terms of will there be a market, will there be uh, countries willing to import um, fossil fuel based power. Um, and with that, I will go on to the next slide. So what does it look like um, a Paris compatible emissions trajectory? So the global discourse pathways we've analyzed here from the IPCC special report 1.5 degree, as mentioned by Deborah, show uh, emissions reductions on the short term of roughly 15 to 33 percent below 2015 level, and on the longer term, 60 to 70 percent. Um, so the 
the country, uh, Egypt and DC currently lists, uh, provide a list of measures, uh, mostly focusing on the energy sector, but does not provide yet an emissions reduction target. Neither um, has framed uh, a net zero objective. Uh, however, I was saying, Salim, this is uh, what well, this will help to set a goal. Um, this will needs to be a company uh, to go along with uh, a trans and transformation of the economy of Egypt, of the global economy. Uh, but the first sector to focus on uh, would be power and oil and gas sector, which we're going to see on the next slide, please. So what does it look like uh, the power sector transformation uh, under those models? So we see a sharp increase in renewable energy. So by 2030, it reached around 70%. Um, this will mainly come along with, uh, will lead to a zero emissions power by around 2040 and will be driven by a phase out of fossil fuels. So we see a gas phase out uh, late 2030s. So by 20, between 2035 and 2039 and no expansion of, of coal. Uh, so what are the opportunities to transition towards uh, decarbonized power? Uh, so we've seen that uh, Egypt has the ambition to serve uh, as a regional energy hub. Um, so as countries, as men I mentioned before, as countries are getting more and more towards uh, decarbonized pathways, they will be more, they will be more eager to, to import uh, power based on a renewable energy. Uh, increasing renewable energy in the power mix uh, increase the efficiency and the stability of the grid, uh, which can also help reducing the power cuts, which the country is still experiencing currently, although they have those available capacities, but which are quite uh, dating, those fossil fuel based capacities. Um, Another uh, point of context, which is interesting to, to discuss here, is the so the Egypt has the goal to, to phase out its fossil fuel subsidies by around 2022, which might be a bit delayed due to the, the pandemic. Um, so this uh, what this will uh, this will transfer the burden of the price to the consumer. But the way to balance this uh, is to increase the power based electricity uh, cheaper, which can be made possible through the development of renewables, for which a funding has never been uh, um, so much available as now. Thank you very much. And I think with that, I will hand it over to uh, Winnie. Thank you very much, Marie Camille. My name is Winnie. Greetings from Nairobi. Um, so starting with Nigeria, in terms of the current situation, Nigeria relies uh, mainly on traditional biomass for its primary energy provision. And in the power sector, it relies on 77% gas and 23% uh, renewables, which is quite low. And you can see this depicted in the graph on your, on your right, where you see the dominance of uh, traditional biomass um, in the primary energy sector and um, gas in the power generation. So there is also reliance on um, generators um, for backup purposes uh, due to, to um, power cuts. And so this is also an issue. And when it comes to emissions, energy is the highest emitting sector because of what I've highlighted above. Um, and it is at 62%. And then this is followed by the agricultural sector, which is at 25%. So this obviously comes with, uh, presents some challenges, um, among them the issue of access to electricity and therefore Nigeria needs to increase its um, access to electricity, uh, especially to promote clean cooking and also to improve its transmission and distribution infrastructure um, and also further increase reliability uh, of its grid to tackle the issue of uh, blackouts and power cuts. Next slide, please. When it comes to the 1.5 degrees emission trajectory for Nigeria, you can see from the graph um, on my right that shows that um, it's conditional NDC um, right here where I'm pointing uh, is actually in line with a 1.5 um, degree compatible domestic emissions range. Uh, which requires cuts of uh, between 13 and 35 percent below 2015 levels when you exclude emissions from land use, land, land use change, and forestry. Um, 
but this also means um, that uh, it will require a lot of international financial support to you know be able to bridge the gap um, in terms of uh, it's uh, between its conditional and unconditional NDC. And then there, there's also the issue of uncertainties around emissions from the land use, land use change and forestry sector that have the potential of um, impacting on the 1.5 degree compatible uh, pathway. And then for Nigeria to be able to um, achieve net zero, it will require to increase its sinks. And this is between a range of 147 to 215 metric tons of carbon dioxide year and uh, by 2050 to be able to enhance this. Next slide, please. And then when it comes to transformation in the power sector in Nigeria, I already mentioned above that uh, Nigeria is heavily reliant on uh, fossil fuels and Salim also highlighted this in his presentation. Uh, and you can see from the, uh, from the, the graph on my right, uh, that shows that Nigeria will need to increase its uptake of renewable energy by at least 58% in 2030 uh, and uh, completely phase out fossil fuels by 2040 if it is to be on a, on a cost-effective pathway uh, for 1.5 degrees. And in line with this, it has come up with an electricity vision, 30-30-30, uh, um, and this simply means uh, 30 gigawatts by, 20, by 2030 and including 30% renewables uh, by the 2030 year. Um, but then also their national energy plan has targets that include coal development and other fossil fuels. Um, and this is an issue of concern because even in recent pronouncements by the government, including the vice president, they've emphasized, um, yes, the need for a just transition, but they also still see gas as part of their um, energy future. But this runs the risk of um, um, trapping Nigeria in, um, in a carbon intensive pathway and also having it uh, with, leaving it with stranded assets um, in the future. So there are a number of opportunities for Nigeria uh, um, in terms of it being able to expand renewable based electricity access to meet its targets but then uh, also to increase electricity access, especially in the rural areas um, and in places that are not reached currently by the grid. And this will also come with other benefits. Uh, you have uh, socioeconomic benefits such as job creation, um, as well as other opportunities that come with this. And then you also have health benefits uh, whereby you have reduced indoor and outdoor air pollution when you're using clean energy for, for cooking, um, as well as lighting and heating purposes. Um, thank you, that is it for Nigeria. I will now move on to Kenya. So when it comes to Kenya, agriculture and energy are the key emitting sectors. And you can see this from the graph on my, on my right. Uh, you can see this is agriculture here at 48% and you have energy at 42%. And it has been projected that under business as usual scenario, land use, land use change and forestry will actually become number two um, by 2030. It will overtake um, the energy sector. And this is because the energy um, sector is uh, expanding with uh, a lot of uh, um, input in terms of renewable energy. So emissions in the energy sector continue to, continue to lower as these developments go on. When it comes to the primary energy uh, mix, you can see that biomass, uh, similar to what we saw in the Nigeria case, that biomass still dominates the power energy mix at 60%. Um, you also have um, oil, you have gas and other um, non-biomass renewables. And then when it comes to the power sector, you will see that in Kenya, it is dominated um, by renewable, renewables at 90%. These include hydro, uh, geothermal, and uh, solar, as well as wind. Next slide, please. When it comes to a 1.5 emissions trajectory for Kenya, its conditional um, NDC is at 79% above 2015 levels. Um, and you can actually see this um, on, the, on the graph, the number two here where I'm pointing. 
And then uh, these compared to the least cost pathway um, would require a 12 to 34% reduction below uh, 2015 levels by 2030. And of course, for Kenya to be able to actually meet this, it will require international financial support because it's conditional, um, conditional um, uh, because of its conditional uh, target and its unconditional target will not be able to uh, meet this. When it comes to net zero um, projections for the future, emissions from the forestry and land use sector are very uh, key to watch. Um, and so they need to be looked into in terms of monitoring emissions in that sector and increasing the capacity for, the, for this particular sector to become a sink. Next slide, please. Uh, when it comes to the power sector transformation, we already noted above that Kenya is uh, predominantly, uh, you know, reliant on renewable energy sources for its power sector. Uh, and you can see that in 2017, on the graph on my right, uh, here, Kenya already was at about 80% um, in 2017. And to be able to, uh, for 2030, for it to be able to keep on a least cost uh, pathway, it would require to be 81%. So then this would indicate that Kenya is already um, um, on this particular, particular pathway. But Kenya also has plans to uh, develop coal, and it has uh, spoken about this in its policy documents, um, development of coal as well as other fossil fuels. But this also runs the risk of putting Kenya on a carbon intense pathway um, and sort of uh, making it uh, you know, get stuck with stranded assets in future at a time when um, a lot of a lot of countries and the the sort of um, uh, discussion at the moment is about decarbonization um, of, of of the different um, economies, and then when it comes to to transformation um, specifically, Kenya needs to target electric cooking so as to be able to move away from the use of traditional biomass for cooking as well as heating. And you saw this from the graph before where biomass dominates the primary energy mix, but this would need to change. And these would have um, benefits, including um, core benefits in the health sector where 22,000 people die annually in Kenya because of uh, respiratory illnesses. And these are mostly attributed to uh, poor air quality um, as a result of using biomass and fossil fuels for cooking and, and heating, especially at household level. So this would be a, a co-benefit that arises from this. There would also be increased job opportunities uh, from the new and also um, ongoing off-grid renewable technologies that are continuing to be taken up um, across the country. Thank you. I will now hand back over to Marie Camille to take us through Senegal. Thank you very much, Winnie. Um, so moving on to Senegal, uh, Senegal uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the country. Uh, when we do exclude the impact of the um, UCF emissions, so the land sector emissions, are mostly dominated by agriculture. So similarly to, to Kenya, with around half of Senegal emissions coming from agriculture and the second emitting sector being energy, with mostly transport and power contributing similarly. Uh, however, the country is expecting under business as usual scenario that its energy sector emissions will overtake um, agriculture by 2022. 2022, sorry. Um, so Senegal is very, is heavily reliant on uh, fossil fuel imports, importing all of its fossil fuel uh, for primary uh, energy and power mix consumption. So what we can see on the graph, around 80% of the power mix is based on oil and which correspond roughly 50% of the primary energy, the rest being uh, biomass mostly used for uh, cooking. Um, the national energy production is mostly dominated by traditional uh, biomass. However, uh, this is likely to change in the near future with the country plans to exploit its uh, oil and gas reserve uh, discovered recently uh, as of 2023. Um, 
then now let's move on to uh, Senegal's emissions pathway. So, so Senegal has targeted um, as a conditional target of reducing its emissions between around 25 to 60 percent above 2010 levels. Um, well, the, the cost-effective pathways we've analyzed here um, shows emissions reductions of around 0 to 23 percent below 2010 level. So this represents quite a high difference uh, in ambition. However, the international community uh, must provide support uh, for the country to engage on such domestic emissions pathway. It's worthwhile to note here this does exclude the land use sector emissions, which are also significant in the case of Senegal due to the use of biomass, uh, a driver of uh, deforestation. Uh, on the road to net zero, so we've seen recently the IEA report stating that net zero is feasible by 2050 with the available technologies globally. Uh, on, the road, on the road to net zero, the country will at some point need to balance its uh, remaining emissions. Um, and, with the, and has the goal, the, the goal to reach universal access to electricity by 2025, which will help to drive a reduction of use of biomass uh, in the cooking uh, subsector, which has the potential to drive, to drive down emissions reductions in the land sector and potentially further to increase in sinks to be able to balance its emissions on the longer term. Um, but to implement this emissions pathway, uh, we will go now into the power transformation and to the power sector to see what would look like a power sector transformation for Senegal. Um, so the model shows a very sharp uh, increase in renewable energy by 2030, so reaching uh, more than 90% uh, in some cases by 2030, which is mostly explained by the huge uh, underexploited uh, renewable energy potential uh, in the country. Uh, which currently targets um, by 2023 uh, renewable energy share uh, of around 29.2% uh, in its plans for an emerging Senegal, the priority action plan, um, which we need to be stepped up, step up to engage on such pathways. The decarbonization of the power sector will come into place with a complete phase out of fossil fuels um, by 2040 which uh, posed the question in terms of, um, so we know the country is going to start the exploitation of its oil and gas reserve uh, in the near future. And so, but what are the opportunities uh, for the country to engage in such a decarbonized um, power sector? So as mentioned earlier, the, the, the rest of the world is engaging on the de decarbonization pathway. So will there be, when we think that power plants last 20, 30 years, will there be a market in the next 10 years for a country to export their power-based uh, um, uh, on fossil fuel? The IEA report on net zero also indicated that no investment uh, uh, in fossil fuel infrastructure is needed on a net zero world. So will there be, uh, will the finance be there when funding is available for renewable energy projects? Uh, so this might bring the risk for the country to stay stuck with stranded assets, um, not being able to export its power sector. Um, increasing the share of its renewable and of renewable energy in its power sector allows the countries uh, also not to to increase its um, uh, renewable energy jobs potential, but also it increases the energy security by reducing the reliance on the 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 imports, uh, the fossil fuel imports. So to give uh, an, an order of magnitude, 48% of the export revenue in 2018 went to, the, to pay the bill of uh, imported fossil fuels. But one last point, but not least, um, so the power sector, when we think of uh, global economy transformation, is really pivotal for the country to decarbonize all of its economy because not only drives um, emissions reductions in the energy sector, but it also drives reductions of emissions in the land sector by reducing uh, deforestation and the use of biomass. And furthermore, uh, in the future, we've increased electricity in the end-use sector, such as transport uh, or industry. It will drive as well re emissions reductions in those sectors. But this will be in the condition of a power, a decarbonized power. And with that, I will hand it over back to Deborah for the Q&A section. Thank you very much, Mark Hamel, and thanks to everyone who has just presented. 
Um, we have a few questions now, and I think I'm going to start with the first one that I will take myself and then I will read out the others uh, for the team to respond to. The first question, well, it's a comment that says, thank you for the information rich event. Can you say something about the tools insight on economic benefits of the transition? So currently the project does not include the, social, the analysis of the socioeconomic uh, benefits per country that we have, we have basically analyzed on a 1.5 pathway. That would be great. In fact, that's what we're looking at doing. Should we get the support? However, we only, we will only be able to do um, core benefits analysis for only two countries in the project. So quite soon in the next coming months, we will be re releasing the core benefits for those two countries, um, but not for, for the rest of the countries. I think this, yeah, that's something that we, we need to look for support for. And I think one uh, question that is also linked to that, there's a question that says, will there be further analysis to determine a rough estimate of funding investments needed for grid infrastructure expansion in Nigeria? Um, yes, I think the one thing that I did not mention in terms of the full scope of the project, although I mentioned that we will still be coming up with the other analysis of the other sectors, the other work package of the project will basically be focusing on the investment requirements of the power sector for each one of the countries that we are analyzing. And that information will be presented in the next coming months. So the project ends uh, towards end of next year. So a period between now and next year, we will still be releasing results. And one of those, the key ones, it's basically the investments uh, requirements for, for, for the power sector for all the countries, including Nigeria. Um, okay, um, there is a question that I'm going to direct to Salim. Salim, it says, what do you think are the biggest opportunities in Africa for countries to transition to a low carbon economy? Salim? Um, uh, yes, uh, I, I thank you for the question, uh, Deborah. Um, at some point, uh, you know, it, it will be good for me to present some analysis of uh, sort of uh, the distinction between oil and gas countries and what the profile of electrification looks like versus countries that don't have oil and gas. And I think it tells a story of that um, oil and gas uh, countries have chosen an electric uh, electrification pathway that is highly dependent on the windfalls that oil and gas revenues generate so they can subsidize, subsidize more uh, uh, oil or gas to power uh, projects uh, in, in, in those countries. So North Africa, uh, we had a, you heard the example of Nigeria and so on. Uh, and we find that there's a pattern also of um, uh, in countries where uh, you have vast solar, water, uh, geothermal and, and wind resources that uh, countries that can uh, run and procure um, high levels of uh, uh, um, uh, public-private partnership uh, sort of uh, investments in renewables have chosen to do that. But the picture for renewables is not uh, very strong. I mean, uh, on the continent, we're dealing with five gigawatts of solar, for example, which is largely in South Africa and a little bit in, in Ethiopia. And if you compare to just India solar uh, you know, the renewables initiative, I think it's, uh, I think by now it's uh, more than 170 uh, uh, gigawatts. So the, the, the potential from a resource point of view is large. The ability to uh, make it happen on the continent requires uh, a better integrated grid infrastructure as one uh, option for solution in terms of a utility model. Uh, and we know that uh, uh, there are certain barriers from the financing and the ability of governments to provide guarantees for, for these projects to happen. And there's a lot of grid infrastructure work that needs to be done and, and invested in. But there are some strategic opportunities in sub-regions. For example, if we had a better integration of uh, the power pool in uh, East Africa, you could get most of the East African region 100% renewables. You could take into account uh, the factors of um, uh, a very uh, uh, aligned uh, 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 in terms of uh, power grid uh, stability issues and so on, that you have uh, hydropower, you've got uh, geothermal, and then you can integrate more variable resources uh, such as wind and solar, and you could, and with a inter-regional power uh, interconnectivity uh, mechanisms, you can uh, take surplus power from one country and uh, 
uh, uh, distribute it to, to other countries. So there's huge opportunities for that type of uh, integrated approach. I would encourage us to think in a more sub-regional level uh, for lots of reasons, which I can go into later. And I think the other challenge which we haven't broken is beyond utilities, more um, decentralized uh, models. And there, I think uh, entrepreneurs, financiers, and so on, uh, still have to break a lot of new ground. But just lastly, on average, uh, the kilowatt cost of renewables, while it's cheaper globally, uh, in Africa, uh, it's still higher than uh, its peers, uh, like uh, Southeast Asia, India, et cetera, where kilowatt hours from renewables, even though it's cheaper and moving in the, in the direction of more, more uh, cost-effective uh, generation, the average cost is still higher uh, to, to peers. So we got a lot of work to do in bringing those costs down. And that's largely related to the cost of capital. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Salim. Um, I think we have two modeling questions. Um, the first one, which I'm going to direct at Lara, is what are the assumptions behind the power sector energy mix projections? Are you taking into account the country potential in renewable energy? Um, and then after Lara's response, Jonas, can you take this one? How did you choose the illustrative global pathways? Lara? Um, yes, uh, sorry. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Deborah. So to your first question, um, what are the assumptions behind the energy mix in the power sector? So we base these assumptions based on the illustrative pathways we're investigating um, from the IPPC and the other lines of evidence. And these pathways do indeed um, consider the current situations in the country, as well as the potentials for these countries to further um, develop um, the, the power generation capacities in the countries. Thank you. And Thank you, Jonas. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Jonas first speaking. How, so the question, uh, I want to repeat it since we, uh, this was already before, how did we choose these illustrative global pathways? And um, Deborah already hinted at it earlier that we studied the models that had been submitted to the IPCC special report in 1.5 and then ranked them so that they would minimize global warming, obviously, that they would rely less on carbon removal technologies like afforestation and reforestation as well as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And we also prioritized pathways which are low on nuclear and fossil generation with carbon capture and storage. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Um, Kim, there is one question for you on South Africa transition from fossil to renewables in the power sector. Um, wouldn't that pose the risk to increase the unemployment rate in the mining sector? Thanks, Deborah. Um, yes, it is possible that there would be job losses in that particular sector, but with careful planning and foresight, um, it is possible to, to be able to move people, um, to retrain people to, to create jobs in uh, other sectors. So, um, Unfortunately, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, so also there have been, sorry, there have been some studies that show that the um, job creation prospects in renewables are actually very good. And considering, at least in the South African case, the, the sheer volume of renewables that would need to be rolled out, um, I think that it would would increase quite dramatically. And so, yeah, there would be significant job creation in the renewables, which might offset losses in power sector. Okay. Thank you. I think we still have a lot of questions. I'm not sure if we will be able to go through all of them. Um, I will take um, last two, three questions uh, as we close. Um, the next one is on Kenya, Winnie. Um, Kenya has high electricity access. Why is there low uptake of electric cooking? 
Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for that question. Yes, uh, that is true. Kenya has reported now that it has over 85% electricity access, but out of um, the whole country, there's only 3% of households that under 3% actually that use um, electricity for cooking. So obviously this is a key concern. Um, so in terms of ensuring that there is uptake for this, there will need to be um, incentives to ensure that people shift to electric cooking. Uh, and these will include incentives such as uh, probably reduction of costs, and also generally just a public dialogue on getting people to shift more to electric cooking, as well as engagement and support by the government to low income um, households, because currently the, the supply for electricity is actually much, much higher than demand, and these are surplus um, in the in the grid. And also um, just a, a point to note, uh, from tomorrow, the, there is an imposition of a 16% VAT, value added tax on LPG gas. Um, so it is anticipated that this might actually um, shift a lot of people towards electric cooking. Uh, but this shift, of course, has to be supported by um, more grid reliability, as well as the incentives that I have mentioned briefly above. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last, uh, I think, more, uh, um, question, well, not second last, uh, before we get to the last one for Salim. Um, this one is on Egypt. It says, does Egypt also have high nitrogen oxide production? What impact does that have on emissions? Uh, Lara, do you want to take this one? Um, yes, maybe to that question, I can um, briefly mention that in our analysis, we do not only um, consider and uh, look at what happens to CO2 emissions in the future, but also focus on what happens to N2O emissions and CH4 emissions, so methane and nitro uh, nitrogen dioxide. Um, if you have a look at the website on the current situation, um, there's a breakdown of um, what share the different um, gases have on the current situation. And um, yeah, maybe you find some, some interesting insights there also, of course, for, for all other countries. Um, concerning other um, compounds which consider nitrogen, we currently do not consider these in our assessments. Okay, thank you. Um, Salim, the last question goes to you. Um, what do you think about the Great Green Wall Initiative as a policy to mitigate, adapt climate change? The UN and some global North countries are supporting the project for its economic and diplomatic opportunities, but some scientists are more critical. Do, do you want to give a comment on that? Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> I don't know too much about the, the Green Wall. It's something that uh, obviously uh, when we developed our Africa Climate Foundation strategy work, we've come across uh you know there are lots of good things said about it in fact it received a big big coverage in uh, national geographic uh but as we uh, have dug more into uh, you know the sahel region itself uh, the, uh, it will take more than the green wall to solve uh, quite a lot of uh, challenging issues uh, around what is increasingly becoming to be seen as a climate security issue in that region uh and in fact um uh, there's a there, there's a double uh, you know tension. On the one hand, uh, the, the, uh, the 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 conflicts, the lack of governance, and um, in many places, uh, you know, uh, these are uh, countries are kind of artificial boundaries um, in a very vast uh, region such as the Sahel. Uh, that uh, often the climate is more of an exacerbating issue of underlying other factors that are cause of uh, conflict and insecurity uh, in that area. One of the, the, the challenges we have is the drying out of Lake Chad, um, pastoralists uh, being, uh, coming into conflict uh, with uh, agriculturalists over water resources and livestock. So there's not just a pure climate issue. So I don't, I don't, I don't think the Great Wall will solve that uh, entirely. Uh, it is uh, something we will uh, uh, examine because uh, Senegal is one of the pivot countries for, for the ACF to work in, including Rwanda, etc. But I thought uh, <clears throat> the, the one thing that, uh, uh, you know, there was a question about jobs uh, and coal. 
Uh, I think it's inevitable that uh, coal mining uh, will decline, that uh, the, if the power electrification moves to more decarbonization, that uh, sec uh, those sectors, uh, mining and, and, and um, the, the coal power sectors are going to lose jobs. The question is, uh, if we understand that that's the future, uh, how do we manage that? That's really the issue. And I think uh, Kim talked about that. Uh, I think the challenge we have in South Africa is that those jobs won't be entirely in coal mining areas. Uh, if we expand renewables geographically in a more dispersed way, lots of jobs will be created elsewhere. So it's not the case of one coal miner uh, who loses a job in a coal mining sector is going to become uh, the next day uh, have a job in a renewable sector. So I think also with utility scale, uh, particularly uh, if you not have a sustained uh, installation, uh, the uh, ability to create uh, jobs in the long term is, is going to be limited. But I think the real opportunity is more in decentralized uh, renewables. And there we can create a lot more sustained jobs over the longer term as uh, over 11 million households in South Africa move to uh, rooftop PV and not take into account industrial and other. So one has to look at the job thing, not as a, just a, about electrons, but the value of uh, that the electrons can create in the economy. And if you didn't have that uh, value, both in terms of as a, a decarbonized electrons, uh, there will be penalties down the line uh, for carbon intense sectors as we move into net, uh, net, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, net zero targets. So my encouragement is to look at the picture in a more holistic way, not just about uh, electrification or uh, shift from one type of electron to another, which is dirty electrons to clean electrons, but look at the process of decarbonization as a whole economic uh, question and, and what kinds of value can be generated by, by decarbonization. So that notion of full employment is really what we need to grapple with. Thank you. Good responses, Salim. Um, I think we have taken questions for all the countries, but I think we've left out uh, Senegal, and I think I'm going to allow Mara Kamel to respond. We have a question on Senegal that says, outside the tool itself, do you know of work that looks at the transition costs related to the shift to EVs? In the case of Senegal, there would be fuel import savings, a clear plus. But a phase when countries like Senegal would see a surge of imports of EVs unless there is domestic manufacturing capacity. Um, is this something you are looking at? The profile of a country's trade balance would be affected for some time. Thanks. Mark um, the last one that you can respond to. Thank you very much, Deborah. So we have so far focused on the power sector. Uh, however, the transport sector is one of the sectors we're going to be adding, uh, hopefully in the next uh, coming month. Uh, where we will look at more not from the perspective of uh, direct EVs penetration and how this will impact the import exports, but rather on the um, energy consumption. So the final energy uh, demand that we create uh, the, penetra the, the increase of electrification of transport. But that we hopefully will have it before the, on the run up to COP26. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Um, I must say that we still have a few questions. What we will do, we have your contact details. Um, we will still uh, respond to you via email. And as I've said earlier, we are open for discussions. If you are interested in a specific country, please let us know, uh, just reach out to us. Our contact details are there um, on, the, on the invitations or our email, you can get it on our website. But I would like to thank you so much for your participation in this session. Um, and we are very eager to get your feedback. So if there's something that comes to mind after the session, please just reach out to us and, and share your, your, your thinking around the, this piece of analysis because the intention of the sessions is basically to try and enhance and make it much more useful um, for, for all the national purposes. And we will be sending around a small survey in the next day or two um, to capture this and just to get your feedback and we'll be grateful if you could uh, respond to those. Um, I must also say that this is one of the sessions, um, original session that we will be having. Um, the next one that we'll be following next week, it's the Asian Pacific region. And then from there, we will be going into other regions. So if you can please just keep um, your eye on the web tool, there will be details there. Um, if you want to get in touch with us. And for anything about follow up uh, on the project, you can get in touch with our colleague from our communications section, Holly, 
you have her email in the invitation uh, email that you have received. So please feel free to reach out if you have any specific questions or any inputs and feedback that you'd like to share with us. So thank you. And this is the end of the session. Thank you so much. Bye.